everyone. Thank you for joining the American Sleep Apnea Association, sleepapnea.org today for our speaker series. We are happy to have Dr. Ilana Oberstein with us today. Uh, she is a board certified internist with a subspecialty in rheumatology. Dr. Oberstein received her Bachelor's of Arts degree from Harvard University and graduated with research distinction from the University of Miami Medical School. And we are happy to have her here today. We also have two of our ASA uh, staff members here with us, Jills Friedman, our Chief Strategy Officer, and Teresa Schumard, our Community Leader and Education Manager. Thank you all for joining us today. Today we're going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, pain and sleep, uh, the links with inflammation, and we're happy to have Alana here as our frontline physician and talk about the new changes that are happening uh, with COVID-19 and the change in patient care. So um, thanks for joining us, Dr. Oberstein, and please tell us a little bit about um, what type of conditions uh, a rheumatologist treats. Sure. First, I want to thank you for the lovely introduction and let you know what a great pleasure it is to be a part of a discussion like this today. I feel as though organizations such as yourself help physicians to connect with patients, and I appreciate that your mission has put the patient at the forefront um, to be an advocate uh, for him or herself. So thank you. It's a great pleasure. Uh, as a rheumatologist, we actually uh, specialize in autoimmune disorders, and what that means, uh, the immune system, how I like to describe this to my patients, the immune system is like the army that is fighting against uh, germs, uh, bacteria, invaders. And when the immune system turns on itself and attacks its own body, that is how we describe an autoimmune disorder. Uh, some very common ones that uh, people may have heard of and that rheumatologists treat include rheumatoid arthritis and uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, also known as SLE or lupus. Um, and interestingly, autoimmune disorders uh, also affect other organ systems and you have uh, dis disorders such as psoriasis. We, we overlap with dermatologists when we treat psoriatic arthritis. Uh, other specialists, such as gastroenterologists, they are treating inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's colitis, ulcerative colitis. Those are autoimmune disorders. And then our neurologists, many times, uh, will be involved in autoimmune disorders when they're treating multiple sclerosis, for example. Um, there are many, uh, celiac disease as well, et cetera. So anything where the immune system turns on uh, its own body, uh, it's called an autoimmune disorder. So that's where I focus. Um, my disorders mainly affect the, the joints, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, and um, I hope that gave you a good sense. Um, we often speak to our community a lot about the relationship that sleep has with a healthy immune system. Uh, could you speak to that for a minute uh, to, you know, bring some clarity to our uh, patients and our community out there? Yes. Uh, sleep is crucial uh, in my field. When the body is at rest and sleeps, all of these pro-inflammatory, um, uh, we call it cytokines, pro-inflammatory um, molecules actually calm down. It's almost like a complete reset, right? And while you sleep, um, the, the mind is rested, the, the, the muscles are rested, and you, you are able to kind of regroup. The hormones, certain hormones uh, calm down. Uh, we think often of kind of uh, the fight and flight mechanism during the day the, that patients are, are all people are constantly on the go and um, working very hard cognitively and physically. While we sleep, all of that calms down. So when we think about important avenues of, of wellness, it, it, sleep is crucial. Um, I think we used to think uh, that it wasn't such a major factor and people prided themselves on run on empty, but the reality is we need that reset. The body needs the reset. The whole system needs it. Um, 
we need good oxygenation while we sleep so that we can continue to have good cognition the next day. And um, it's, it's all tied together. So I think sleep, excellent diet, um, issues of mindfulness are, are now coming to fruition where we need to really focus on that to also reset our body. Uh, all of these are important features to decrease stress and be able to uh, function at our highest level uh, during the day. Um, in my journey with the American Sleep Apnea Association, I had learned I have learned that there is a relationship between um, gout, which is a condition I believe that you may see in your patients and in your office, and, and apnea. Can you can you just talk about that for a moment? Yeah, there was actually an interesting study in um, arthritis and rheumatology that came out in 2018 that discussed this link between sleep apnea and gout. Um, they, there are many comorbidities that are seen in both populations, whether it be high blood pressure, um, obesity, uh, diabetes. But when these factors were controlled for, they still found that patients with sleep apnea had a higher incidence of gout. And the thinking was that when you have sleep apnea and if there's a drop in oxygenation while you sleep, you may actually have an increased production in uric acid. And uric acid is the byproduct that settles in the joints and causes gout. So in theory, um, if one was to utilize CPAP, for example, or maintain uh, normal levels of oxygenation and combat the sleep apnea by the utilization of that um, uh, ther therapy, CPAP, uh, and you maintained appropriate oxygenation, you would, in theory, uh, reduce your risk for this, uh, for, for increase in uric acid and, and therefore reduce uh, the incidence of gout. So that, that's a thought. But fundamentally, again, it goes to show you how sleep is essential in um, down-regulating or decreasing inflammatory cascades. We need sleep to, to reset. As I continue to say, it's just the best way I explain it to my patients. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I think that's great. I mean, that's not something that we've talked a lot about in the past. Um, uh, we've touched on, uh, you know, inflammatory uh, environment in your body in relationship to your sleep. Um, but I think you explained it really well. I appreciate you, you getting that out there. Um, Jills, I'll go ahead and let you talk to uh, Dr. Augustine for a couple minutes. Inflammatory um, drugs or NSAIDs are reportedly the most prescribed medication for treating conditions as, such as arthritis. Most people are familiar with over-the-counter non-prescription NSAIDs such as aspirin or ibuprofen. NSAIDs are more than just pain relievers. What are their role and what are some of the most commonly prescribed? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh are many over-the-counter, Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen. These are some of the common names that we hear. Um, and then there are some that are by prescription. Uh, patients and, and uh, people may be familiar with uh, Meloxicam, Mobic, uh, Diclofenac, Indomethacin, um, and a, a specific uh, category of NSAIDs such as Celebrex. The idea here, once again, is to decrease inflammation, to suppress that cascade. Um, in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, uh, inflammation occurs primarily at the level of the joint, where a patient would have um, stiffness and swelling at the joint level. So by using these, this category of medications, the goal is to decrease uh, the inflammation. I would say what's very important is the side effects of these medications. So uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the NSAIDs, are of concern when used, of course, without physician uh, oversight. The reason why is they can have side effects such as an increase in your blood pressure. Um, if they're not taken on a full stomach or with some food, you could sustain uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, or uh, people may commonly say a, a, a very upset stomach, an ulcer, uh, and that, that could be very concerning. 
Um, and uh, those are two such examples where uh, physician oversight is very important. And fundamentally, we use uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, many times temporarily to try to decrease the inflammation, uh, help a patient get back to their activities of daily living, their regular baseline um, activities. And many times we do that by adding a different type of medicine to help us um, uh, reduce the use of NSAIDs because you really don't want to be on them forever and eternity long term. Uh, for example, another possible side effect is kidney dysfunction. So you don't want to have uh, a toxicity or a bad effect on your kidneys. So we use them short term, get inflammation under control. And many times, depending on what the autoimmune disorder is or rheumatologic disorder, we'll use another medication uh, to, to help a, a different pathway, for example, and, and uh, reduce the use of NSAIDs. Yeah. Uh, in fact, since I'm French, I'm going to say something. In France, since January, all NSAIDs are no longer over the counter. That was a decision made uh, in early January. And then with COVID-19, the French Minister of Health uh, put out a warning saying that people using NSAIDs were at a higher risk of severe COVID-19 reaction. Yes, uh, I actually think it's very wise that your uh that the French uh, government uh, intervened because it's a great example where an over-the-counter medication uh, can be of concern if not used in the correct and appropriate fashion. So it, it's crucial that um, that there's oversight. I, I think that that was wise because of all the reasons I said. Um, if, if people are not taking them in a regulated fashion, there could be some serious adverse effects. Absolutely. Uh, can you speak to managing your patient's pain and sleep issues, please? Absolutely. Um, again, sleep is crucial. Um, you're in a vicious cycle if you are sleep deprived. Uh, when you're sleep deprived, the, uh, the body doesn't rest you're in almost a state of constant go. The um, inflammatory cytokines are up. Your inflammation is up. And um, you're almost, the, the, the phrase, you're, you're burning the wick at both ends, if that's the phrase. You're, you're just, you're, you're going to burn out. Burning the candle, I think, is the phrase on both ends. And you're going to burn out. Um, I tell all my patients that this is a multifactorial attack on an autoimmune disorder. You have to listen to what your doctor says, for example, with respect to medications, but also excellent diet, okay, things in moderation, okay, uh, keeping your weight low or at least within what we call a normal BMI, body mass index, you wanna keep a good weight. You wanna exercise daily. You want to practice meditation and mindfulness, which also helps us to decrease the fight or flight inflammatory uh, cascade. And then sleep. We need sleep. Also, keep in mind that with appropriate sleep, we actually improve our, our risk, if you will, to getting an infection, right? The body is reset. Uh, we're able to combat uh, germs and, and microbes uh, more appropriately, so we can actually reduce our risk for infection with good sleep. That's well known. You spoke before about lupus being one of the medical conditions you treat, and everyone hears on the news about hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for lupus patients and other uh, rheumatoid conditions. How does this medication help uh, lupus patients? So, um, you know, this is, a, this is a hot topic, as you mentioned. Um, we know that hydroxychloroquine reduces all-cause mortality in lupus. It's an excellent medication for lupus patients. Um, it, it works at the immune cellular level, uh, reducing, again, these uh, cytokines. What I would tell you, is, which is very important at this moment, is we know it helps lupus patients. We know that it decreases um, end organ damage or uh, 
uh, organ dysfunction in lupus, uh, kidney, heart, lungs. It is used in patients who are pregnant who have lupus, for example. So what's been very interesting in this current pan pandemic is some of our lupus patients are having a hard time uh, filling their prescriptions for hydroxychloroquine. Um, there were some uh, areas where uh, people wanted prescriptions just in case to have this medication. Uh, studies are ongoing to see the effect fundamentally of hydroxychloroquine in COVID patients. Uh, there's been some recent uh, literature that's come out that using hydroxychloroquine in healthcare workers to prevent COVID-19 uh, infection uh, has not materialized. So um, what I would say right now is in lupus, we know it helps lupus patients. So it's crucial that lupus patients have access to hydroxychloroquine during this pandemic. And uh, we are working very closely with our pharmacists. Many times if I write a prescription for hydroxychloroquine, they want uh, data verification that this is indeed for a patient who has an underlying condition in which hydroxychloroquine helps. So uh, physicians are providing that information so that our patients can get this medication because uh, the data does indicate that it helps our lupus patients and we want to make sure they have access to this. Sorry, I was yes. mute. Um, it also helps rheumatoid arthritis patients. And uh, many people with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are taking this medication now for a long time. In fact, it's fundamental for their well-being. So if hydroxychloroquine was working so well for COVID-19, you would expect uh, much less COVID-19 among the population of people with either lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And the study came out showing that that's not the case. Yeah, that's right. I mean, right now, uh, we are in a hotbed of data collection. Um, I know that uh, American Sleep Apnea Association is, is very big on data. And that's where we are right now with respect to this disease. We have a registry amongst rheumatologists where we are reporting any of our patients who may be affected with this uh, virus. Um, you're right, hydroxychloroquine is not just used in lupus, it's used in a variety of inflammatory uh, arthritic conditions and uh, has had much success in, in that area. Um, we are studying aggressively uh, our rheumat rheumatology patients not, uh, uh, not as affected by COVID. And as you said, I mean, we, we just, we cannot say that. Um, there's a variety of other anti-rheumatic drugs that have come uh, into the news recently uh, to treat COVID, one being um, an IL-6 inhibitor, that's an interleukin-6 inhibitor called Actemra, tocilizumab, which is also being used in patients uh, right now with COVID-19 who are experiencing this cytokine storm, this uh, uh, extreme inflammatory response to the virus. Uh, again, uh, this is all being, this is real time data that's being collected. And I think um, a as, a, as a whole, globally, we will be uh, learning uh, now and into the future of this pandemic, uh, what the role is for all of these drugs uh, with respect to COVID and, and how they uh, help or hinder our, our patients right now. Thank you for all the work you do. Uh, Theresa, do you have some questions? Yes, I do. I would really like to find, find out if the, um, the, the whole experience with COVID in, in your area, how can you tell us or describe for us, you know, how you've been managing those patients, um, not being able to see most of them in person? Are you... Um, you know, managing some of that with telemedicine? Yeah, that's a great question, Teresa. Um, I have been leveraging telehealth exclusively, um, and it's crucial. We are actually right now at a shelter-in-place uh, order here where I am in, in Miami-Dade, and um, it's important to keep our patients at home. We don't want them taking any unnecessary risks 
uh, leaving home, venturing into a medical professional building where there may be other people um, with other underlying issues and conditions. So I have leveraged telehealth exclusively. Um, I feel that this is crucial also because I'm able to connect with my patients. I can do real-time audio, video, synchronous chat. Uh, like today, leveraging this platform. And what that affords me is an ability to see how they're doing, um, refill medications so that they are not without medication. I don't want them to flare with their underlying condition because I'm trying to keep them out of urgent cares. My goal is to keep all my patients out of an urgent care or an emergency room because that's that's the front line for COVID right now. So if, if I can help my, my ER physician colleagues to keep all of my patients with chronic uh, disorders out of their uh, emergency rooms, I've done a great service. So telehealth is amazing. About, um, you know, I, I mean, this is just the new, the new normal for a lot of people, uh, but some people are you know, lacking the equipment that they need to be able to do uh, an effective telemedicine uh, visit with their physician. And what are, and then also you have some people that are maybe technically they have not experienced anything like this before. This is very new to, to, to some patients. Um, I think, you know, is there anything that you could advise to people, uh, you know, looking in, in forward times that they might have to be doing this more than we, we think they would. But if you have any um, tips for people, that would be wonderful. Yes. You know, it's funny. I, um, I thought there would be more resistance to meeting with, uh, with your physician remote like this on a virtual platform. I have found that patients have really embraced it. Um, even my octogenarian patients, um, we'll call them uh, telephonically and we'll say, what, um, what app have you been using to chat with your grandkids who live in uh, California, for example? And interestingly enough, many of them have great experience leveraging some platform, whether it's FaceTime, WhatsApp, uh, and you walk them through whatever platform you're using um, through your electronic health you know, record vendor, and you can walk them through it. And with a little bit of patience, um, both on the physician and the patient side, I find that it's very successful. So I'm actually um, cautioning people to say, I don't want to meet with my physician and kind of kick the can down the road. I'll check in with you in three months after COVID is over. I'm cautioning people not to do that. We don't know the future trajectory of this pandemic. We don't know if there'll be a second surge. Um, and you know what? There are other natural disasters that occur. I mean, here in South Florida, we have hurricanes. And, you know, we may be out of electricity for a few days, but then when we're back up and running with electricity or cellular data, we may have other issues of debris. We can't get to office buildings. And we may find ourselves very happy to leverage telehealth again in an instance like that. So I think COVID-19, it was a moment where crisis uh, led us to opportunity. And we were able to leverage telehealth as um, regulations uh, allowed us to do so. And I'm telling my patients, let's not kick the can down the road. Let's use this. I think other examples that are great are... Um, you know, I have a lot of school teachers that are patients of mine, and they teach children from 7.30 in the morning until 3.30 at night, in the afternoon. Uh, maybe they give extra help after school that br bring them to about 4.30. And then they'd hop in their car and try to speed over to our office before it closed at 5 p.m. And many times they'd miss their appointment. They just didn't make it. Not because they're, they're negligent or uh, non-compliant. They just really couldn't fit it in their day. But now, if they're done with that uh, extra help with that child at 4.30 p.m., they could hop on a telehealth call and still make it before our office closes at 5 p.m. So I think there's so many great examples of leveraging um, this type of platform to render patient care. Um, I have patients who are college students who I would traditionally see in the summer and winter break. And 
you know what? Now with telehealth, I can catch them when they're having perhaps a flare in the middle of the spring and they're still off, you know, out of, out of town. So I can give you so many examples and I'm helping my patients walk through it. My staff will help uh, patients walk through a telehealth visit. And remember, when you use telehealth, um, you get access to your patient portal usually. So you're, you're helping your patients not just to communicate with the doctor, but to better familiarize themselves with how to communicate with the doctor through an electronic health record, leveraging the portal, uh, intramail or, or messaging uh, via email their physicians. So I think overall, it's going to help improve efficiency in the patient-doctor communication, and hopefully that will improve ultimate outcomes for our patients. Yes, I definitely think that your example of being able to utilize telehealth and all of the benefits that it can offer uh, moving forward to just lighten the load on all of us. Um, you know, some of us are in rural areas where it takes just a long time because you're miles away from a physician or a facility or someone that can help you. And, or maybe you're in a urban area where it's not that far, but with traffic and everything else that's going on, it takes you still an hour to get there. So, you know, getting everybody comfortable with this now might be a really big benefit as we just move forward in life and be able to, you know, Take the technology step forward. We have it with our phones and everything else. And let's go ahead and do that, you know, with the, uh, how we receive our health care as well. Yeah. Uh, Jills, do you have any final questions for Dr. Oberstein? Uh, no, just one last comment about uh, telehealth. One of the things that it provides, uh, one of, I think, one of the great advantages it will provide to patients is that you don't have to wait for hours uh, to see the doctor. One yes. of the things that drives people crazy, it's gone. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's a very efficient way to connect with your patients. Um, I think I'd like to also say many times specialists have very long waiting lists to be seen. Um, I know, for example, in rheumatology, uh, many times there's a two, three month wait. And I feel as though with telehealth, we can actually improve uh, uh, the, the way in which patients are seen. Uh, you can have your follow-up visits. You can schedule new patient visits. And uh, again, without the commute, without the wait, uh, it's just very efficient. And yeah. if that can reduce uh, wait times to get in with a physician, then that's another win for using this type of platform uh, to see patients. So I agree with you completely. Sure. So do you think there is going to be an urgent need for changing the curriculum in med schools to teach the, for the coming doctors to do medicine uh, through telehealth? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think that uh, this, again, this has been an eye-opening experience. I think that um, the curriculum needs to move with the times. There are so many great examples, not just telehealth, but uh, wearable devices, you know very well in, uh, in your patient population that you advocate for uh, with the American Sleep Apnea Association, that um, there are a variety of wearable devices where you can uh, record uh, levels. Uh, patients can be recording now on their Apple Watch a variety of issues, uh, heart rates. Um, in rheumatology, there are virtual physical therapy platforms so where you can do uh, exercises post-operatively after a surgery, um, so many things that are utilizing technology now, not just uh, to see your, your doctor, but to report to your doctor how you are doing, sure. uh, whether it's weight loss, whether it's hours of sleep you're accomplishing, whether it is um, exercise you're able to perform after a joint replacement, for example. All of these uh, ancillary modalities through wearable devices and, and tracking uh, apps are, are crucial. And I think that medical school, you know, the curriculum needs to embrace this. Uh, this is the way of the future. Uh, our patients, uh, it's, it's, it's not just seeing them and laying your hands on them. It's what have they been doing for the past 90 days since you've seen them. Sure. And, you know, the days of keeping a pen and paper journal 
may very well be out the window. Some patients love it, and I love to see those journals. Uh, pain scales, uh, you know, how are you feeling on a scale of 1 to 10 today? Uh, that can very easily be incorporated in an app. We can get graphic distribution of how our patients are doing. And 100%, I think it's crucial that, uh, that the medical schools keep this in mind because uh, many times our patients teach us much more uh, in what they're adapting and adopting in their own uh, worlds. And we need, to, uh, we need to learn from that as physicians. I learn every day from my patients. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to uh, have a medical degree and uh, to get to interact with people on such a human level. Yeah. Most of, I mean, all the patients suffering from chronic conditions have their condition almost all the time outside of the medical environment. And until now, none of this was ever collected properly. And now with telehealth and the wearables, you can follow continuously what's happening with the patient. It's amazing. Yes. I, I want to thank again uh, the American Sleep Apnea Association for this great opportunity to speak today um, to, to your, uh, your viewers. And I want to thank you again for, for your mission uh, to, to help patients through education, uh, research, and advocacy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alana, thank you. for your time today very much. Um, I just want to point out two quick call to actions for, for our community here in this talk. I think one very important thing that we discussed was um, the use of over-the-counter medicines and make sure that you are communicating with your doctor uh, what you think may be something that is, you know, okay to take for extended period or whatever you think or want to do with it to communicate to your doctor because they're, you know, they are prescriptions. Um, they are medicines just very similar to that that, you know, the pharmacist has to hand to you. So it's important for you to, you know, speak to your doctor and make sure that you're not going to cause some other extended issue um, unknowingly. I think that was a good point. And um, again, just, you know, just like, you know, to touch on again about the telehealth that, you know, even though we're here at home and, you know, there's still an opportunity for you to get in touch with your doctor and you should do that if you're not feeling well if something is coming up um, you know give the office a call they'll have telehealth appointments they'll get you set up they'll help you work through it as Teresa said if you you know are uncomfortable with the technology you're not the only one uh, in their practice that is feeling that and you know you will find the uh, the help that you need to get that appointment to get the guidance that you need um, even while you're at home which is yeah so, well, I want to thank everybody here for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Oberstein, for your time, Jills and Teresa, for your great questions and, and to help our community. Um, we are here every Tuesday at 3 o'clock with our speaker series, so happy that you were able to join us. And if I can also announce, if you didn't know already, please visit us at sleepapnea.org. We have our third uh, patient summit coming up on May 15th. Uh, was going to be another wonderful in-person event but with everything that's been going on, it's becoming a webcast for uh, the 15th. So we'd like you to check out the agenda that we have uh, and what's going to happen online on uh, May 15th and register for the event. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Take care.